Good morning, everybody. Uh, we start the third day's uh, program. Uh, <clears throat> today's uh, special panel is East Asia Security and Geopolitical Narratives of the Region. We have uh, four uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, <clears throat> it will be Dr. Titli Basu, Professor Sandeep Mishra, Ambassador Skantayal, and Professor Jabin Jacob. So uh, one of, like somebody pointed out uh, yesterday, uh, one of the really interesting things of this conference is that it is uh, encouraging young, bright scholars in the field. So I think it's in the fitness of things that we start with the youngest and uh, one of the brightest scholars on Japanese studies. I call upon uh, Dr. Titli Basu. You get about 12 minutes. Uh, 12 minutes each, and then maybe we can uh, throw the floor open for discussions. Uh, thank you, Professor Balachandran, and good morning to all of you. Uh, I would uh, begin by uh, thanking uh, ICS and uh, Global General University for organizing this very intellectually stimulating uh, exercise. Um, uh, I have been asked to uh, briefly talk about uh, basically situate Japan in uh, East Asian uh, security context. So, um, uh, to begin with, uh, let me just say that uh, as we all uh, know that the East Asian security order is fast altering and the arrival of China as an important actor in the international system is, uh, all, uh, is changing the uh, regional balance of power. Uh, now, future of East Asia is going to be determined by a set of uh, uh, variables, particularly uh, I think the most important is the distribution of power uh, in terms of uh, between the uh, the established power and the rising challenger in the region and we are simultaneously seeing a phenomena that is rising not only in East Asia but also in Southeast Asia which is the emergence of dual hierarchies where the uh, security hierarchy is uh, dominated by the uh, US and the economic hierarchy is increasingly being uh, dominated by uh, China. Uh, now uh, East Asia also hosts uh, uh, Cold War structures. Um, uh, and uh, several geopolitical hotspots uh, because if we look at Japan itself, it has uh, uh, contested uh, territorial disputes with all uh, its neighbors. It is also a region which uh, hosts three of the top ten um, uh, countries in terms of military spending if you look at CPRI data. Uh, it, it is experiencing uh, nuclear proliferation. There are different uh, uh, political systems uh, in the countries um, in, in East Asia. There is rising nationalism. There is uh, uh, aggressive historical baggage. So all these uh, uh, variables are playing when we look at uh, the East Asian theater. Now, uh, the traditional US uh, Hub and Spokes and Francisco Alliance system uh, defined uh, East Asian security for since the post-war period through Cold War and also uh, the post-Cold War era, particularly its alliance with the, uh, South Korea and uh, Japan. Now, if we look at the policy discourse uh, that is uh, emerging from Tokyo, whether it is uh, the uh, national security guidelines, the first maiden national security guideline which came in 2013, or the, uh, the latest national uh, defense program guidelines or the annual defense white papers, it consistently argues that Japan is operating in, a, in, in one of the most severe uh, uh, security environment in, uh, post -war, uh, since the post-war era, particularly um, uh, with the advancement of uh, uh, the nuclear and ballistic missile program uh, of the North Koreans on one hand, and the Chinese attempts at altering the uh, the status quo uh, in the region um, on the other hand. Uh, now Japan is obviously adapting and reacting to the uh, to these realities and um, for a very long time since the post-war period we have seen that Japan has officially adopted a defense oriented, um, uh, exclusively defense oriented uh, security policy posture. Uh, but uh, that is, we see that since uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe came to power, there are uh, certain adjustments that, that is unfolding in the uh, security policy um, of Japan. And this in turn has also raised uh, certain concerns in the region itself, uh, particularly uh, uh, China, uh, but, uh, the region which already has a very um, uh, 
aggressive historical baggage. So there is a response from the regional stakeholders, whether it is South Korea and even North Korea and China, what kind of Japan that the region will have to deal with, whether it is going for a full-blown uh, remilitarization or it is a gradual incremental normalization that we are going to see, or there are some uh, discussion also in terms of what are the prospects of seeing a nuclear uh, Japan in the uh, long term. So uh, in this backdrop, I would just like to make uh, a couple of points uh, to set the discussion. Uh, one is um, with the fluidity in the East Asian uh, regional order that is um, unfolding with the uh, dilution of US primacy and the emergence of China, Japan is certainly revisiting its uh, strategic uh, calculations. And the primary objective of Japan's strategy is being a beneficiary of the US-led regional order is to reinforce that order as the balance of power changes. Uh, now, it, as I already mentioned, it has been a traditional anchor of the US alliance system in the region, and so it is perceived, uh, it's a, it has envisioned a role of uh, becoming a stabilizer of the US-led system. And it, uh, opposes uh, the emergence of a Sinocentric Asian order. Uh, the primary idea is to complement the US efforts in terms of uh, restraining the uh, hegemonic aspirations of China in the region th within uh, the framework of the US-Japan uh, Security Alliance. Now, when we look at US-Japan Security, uh, of course, when uh, China doesn't perceive uh, <laughs> the US-led order as a very perfect one. It's certainly a flawed one uh, when you look at uh, the Beijing's articulation. Uh, at the political spectrum, because American liberalism, they believe, uh, believes in um, export of um, uh, values like democracy and human rights. But at the security spectrum, it, is, uh, it reflects uh, the Cold War in mindset. And um, of course, uh, they, uh, they perceive American alliance in, this, uh, in the region as uh, uh, in terms of containment of China. And, um, but uh, this was all not always the case. If you look at the post-war uh, years, uh, China actually had a favorable uh, impression of the US-Japan alliance in terms of checking or uh, restraining uh, re-emergence of uh, Japanese remilitarization. But that narrative has over the years uh, changed um, when we look at uh, Beijing's uh, discourse. Now, the second uh, point I would like to flag is that uh, uh, U.S. alliance lies at the core of uh, Japan's security and foreign policy. But the alliance itself uh, has its own stress and pull. Um, the basic arrangement is um, U.S. extending extended uh, nuclear deterrence uh, for Japan and access to its markets. In, in return, um, uh, you know, seeking forward deployment in the Asia-Pacific and uh, seeking Japan's support in terms of uh, securing it le its leadership role in the region. Uh, but uh, it has always been an asymmetrical partnership because Japan has its own limitation in terms of constitutional restrictions under Article 9. So it could not uh, exercise the right to collective self-defense, which has been a source of contention between the uh, alliance since the Cold War and post-Cold War uh, era. So it has always navigated the dilemma of uh, abandonment and entrapment uh, within the alliance framework. Uh, Having said that, uh, today uh, with Trump administration, there is a lot of uh, rhetoric uh, that we come across in terms of uh, America first policy, burden sharing, uh, not only vis-a-vis -vis Japan, but also in terms of all its allies. But if you look at Japan, uh, Japan has always been criticized by the United States as a passive free rider. So uh, uh, even though it is one of uh, one of the um, uh, few allies, I think it's one of the, uh, it shares around 48.5% of the uh, cost sharing uh, uh, within the alliance framework, which is one of the highest um, if you look at all the uh, U.S. allies in the region. The third point is that uh, even though U.S. and Japan are uh, aligned in terms of pursuing the larger objective of uh, ensuring U.S. primacy in the region, there are certain uh, gaps uh, that have emerged when you look at uh, Washington and Tokyo's uh, policy articulation. For example, in the security realm, if we talk about um, how Trump administration has approached uh, the new denuclearization uh, issue um, uh, while negotiating with the, um, uh, with, uh, the Kim Jong-un regime in terms of decoupling the ICBMs with the short and uh, medium range ballistic missile is a cause of uh, serious concern for, the, uh, for Tokyo. 
Um, with China also there are certain gaps th that are emerging uh, uh, on both sides. Uh, but these are, uh, these are more on the geo-economic side. For example, if we look at the reaction that uh, we saw from the Trump administration uh, refusing to grasp the strategic importance of TPP, uh, it, it actually took uh, Japan uh, a, a, a step back uh, before it actually plunged into a, a leadership position in terms of concluding the uh, TPP 11 that we saw. Um, so uh, moving on, uh, fourthly, I would uh, say that um, when we look at Japan's strategy, we are seeing both uh, um, in both, uh, there is manifestation of both internal and external balancing that is happening. I'll focus only on the internal balancing part. We are all aware that uh, it is uh, uh, revisiting the security, uh, the post-war security posture. We have seen that uh, under uh, after Prime Minister Abe came in, um, uh, we saw the first national security strategy coming up. There has been uh, expansion in reinterpretation of Article 9 um, in 2000. 14 through a cabinet decision which followed by a series of legislations and uh, subsequently there has been an upgradation of the US Japan uh, defense gu guidelines but there are certain other uh, fundamental changes that are um, unfolding for example the conventional uh, defense spending gap of 1% of the GDP has is no longer in place so uh, there is a debate within Japan uh, how much should be the cap and the standard 2% of uh, GDP cap is currently being uh, debated. We have also seen there is a political debate on developing counter-strike uh, capabilities uh, to deal with the, uh, um, the missile threats that are emanating from the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we have also seen that they are upgrading uh, the, uh, the platforms, he helicopter destroyers from sea control platforms to strike carriers. So uh, there is also a renewed, uh, renewed uh, discussion or conversation on weighing in the uh, nuclear option. I I'm not saying that uh, the, uh, the discussion is on that Japan should go nuclear or not. The discussion right now uh, among the mainstream political leaders, whether it is Taro Aso or Fumio Kishida, is that there is a need to at least weigh in. Uh, it's no longer a taboo that you know they can. Uh, they can be, they f can feel comfortable under Article 5 of the uh, Security <laughs> Treaty, and uh, I think uh, this is not new. When the first nuclear test happened uh, from the Chinese side, we uh, know that um, uh, uh, there, there, there was a lot of study con conducted um, in Japan in terms of weighing uh, in the the in realist terms the uh, cost benefit analysis of going nuclear. Um, so uh, moving on to the, uh, the, the, the next point, I would say that uh, these kind of changes has actually created a lot of uh, uh, anxiety within the region, uh, given the uh, history uh, um, uh, or the memory of Imperial Japan. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, the articulation from Beijing or Seoul or even uh, Pyongyang, uh, they actually uh, uh, argue that they, that uh, Tokyo is actually uh, engineering or manufacturing a uh, external threat or a China threat theory in order to uh, you know justify to their electorate or seek their own uh, pursue their remilitarization ambitions that uh, Prime Minister Abe has. The last and the final point uh, for a stretch of time uh, I would make is that uh, currently in my understanding what is happening in Japan is uh, Japan is pursuing a, a, a normalization course. Uh, it, it is uh, seeking to become a normal country so that it can contribute um, uh, more to the international peacekeeping operations and exercise uh, collective self-defense which has been a constraint on Japan because of Article 9 of the Constitution. Um, if we look at the security, domestic security uh, policy discourse in Japan through Cold War and uh, post-Cold War era, there are uh, essentially four schools of thought, uh, which just the last line. Uh, there are four schools of thought. Um, uh, one is uh, the pacifist and the mercantilist, and uh, followed by the normalist and the uh, uh, nationalist. Now, pacifists who believed in the Yoshida doctrine uh, dominated during the Cold War period, but it, subsequently we see the emergence of the nationalists uh, who are the conservative right, but the difference between the normalists and the nationalists who are the far right is that whatever Japan is trying to pursue, the, the, um, the kind of uh, greater role that they are assuming in the international uh, stage is within the framework of US-Japan uh, alliance. 
However, the nationalists argue for, uh, yeah. uh, the nationalists argue that um, the, the, that the, uh, it seeks greater autonomy outside, independent of the uh, US alliance. So as Japan uh, envisions its role as a proactive contributor to peace, I think Japan needs to balance the kind of uh, expectation its uh, alliance partner has from, uh, its, uh, from Japan and the regional sensitivities uh, that it has to navigate. So I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was an excellent coverage of uh, <clears throat> the very various variables that Japan is confronted with. How does uh, it look at its uh, security calculus? I think um, a brief uh, historical coverage was given and she brought it up to date and uh, brought in the major uh, issues that uh, really matter. Thank you. As, um, as is the convention in this conference, we'll take the questions towards the end after the uh, speakers. Now I'll call upon uh, <coughs> Dr. <laughs> Sandeep Mishra, um, who is an associate professor at uh, JNU. Uh, his theme is uh, Changing East Asia and Korean Peninsula. Uh, Dr. Mishra is um, uh, one of the foremost, uh, if not the uh, leading uh, Korean uh, expert in India. And uh, former colleague, uh, Dr. Mishra, the floor is yours. 12 minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Good morning, everybody. Uh, my presentation theme is uh, Changing East Asia and Korean Peninsula. Uh, the theme, actually, I selected because when I was teaching at Delhi University, one Korean scholar came. Actually, I taught 12 years at Delhi University, 2004 to 16. So that's also my, uh, you can say, affiliation. So uh, I, uh, uh, he told me that, look, Korea is a country which is located, which is of a wrong size and placed at a wrong place in the map. So basically, my theme is that look, if you look at whole changing and you can say, uh, you can say political and security narratives in, 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 in uh, East Asia, Korea appears to be quite, you can say, small in size and is basically placed among giants, actually. And that makes the uh, Korean case quite uh, difficult. I can give you an example. These are the three statements, in, if you can read. That, uh, uh, that were actually spoken in three different period. The first statement was in late 19th century, early 20th century. The second was around Cold War and Korean War. Co Cold War actually, before Cold War, actually when, just before Korea got independence. And third is basically uh, in co contemporary, say last one or two years. So I think you can see that uh, they had to choose between great powers, and that is really. Uh, so my, my basic uh, uh, understanding is that, look, there have been three big changes in East Asia. One is the late 19th century, 20th century, and another basically around end of Second World War, and third is basically what's happening nowadays, US-China contest. And I see that, look, in all the three important big changes, Korea has been you can say, at a very difficult position. They had to choose, they have to, dis you can say, think about what kind, and that has created lots of problem for them. Uh, in the first big change, we know about decline of China, rise of Japan, growing interests of Russia, arrival of West, and that led in Korea, you can see, to a kind of confusion without, about, say, at least three ideas, civilization, race, and nationalism. So civilizationally, Korea considered that they are part of Chinese civilization. But many Japanese scholars in late 19th century, they were also arguing that Korea is part of yellow race. Yellow race means racially, Chai, like Korea and Japan, they are connected. And there were other scholars who were talking about Korean indigenous autonomous nationalism. And you can see the Taiwan Gon, and so many you can say debates. So I, I will not go into details, but you can see that even the independence gate of Korea, it was built, it had nothing to do with Japan actually. It was basically to disassociate itself from China, saying that now we are an independent, uh, uh, you can say, country. Independence. So, lots of, the, in 19, like say 1896, 97, one year, because of big players fighting on Korean Peninsula, uh, King Kojong of Korea, he had to go and stay in Russian legation, Russian embassy. It's really a uh, very difficult uh, period of Korean history. What happened, you can see that two wars happened, colonization of Korea happened, and Korea had to suffer. Uh, 
in case interested, I think we can debate further. The second big change when we had uh, in East Asia, because First World War actually it was not very big uh, upheaval in Korea, uh, or say East Asia. The Second uh, World War, I think Japan got defeated, and uh, we know that bipolar contest started, and China also, PRC began. You can see that Korean issue were discussed, different wartime conferences, and Korea, uh, they tried themselves to have a, their own people committee and having their own Korean People's Republic in September 1945. So I think uh, Korean uh, leaders, they tried to divide, can say, have their own unified country, but I think Cold War dynamics, they divided Korea, and Korea, I think, had to face a very devastating Korean War. Millions of people died, and further on, the Korean destiny was. So this is the second change, and I think uh, I, I will say that in, in all these two, and the third big change which we have been talking about right now, uh, you may disagree with me that whether this is the third big change or not, uh, but I think if this is a third big change in Korea, or say East Asia, uh, I think Korea had to uh, deal with that. In this th uh, third one, actually, the main uh, important, say, theoretical discussion you might have seen, people are talking about dual hierarchy, means uh, economically China, you know, China is having, China is trading partner number one of more than 120 countries in the world. They are trading partner number one of South Korea, North Korea, Japan, you, you name any country, almost um, all the important countries. Uh, power transition theory, people are saying that this is the, a period in world politics when power is going to be, uh, uh, can say, changed from a uh, United States-led global order to maybe China. Uh, not immediate future, but I think at least in, in, in coming future. So lots of uh, debates have been happening. So uh, I think uh, rise of China. So I, I, I have identified three important things, rise of assertive China. You can see these are the titles of some books published in last, uh, say, 10 years. You can see the title and you can understand how they perceive China. Xi Jinping and assertive China, I don't have to say much because the audience knows more about this thing. Uh, my, my basic uh, understanding is that at least there are two important things which China has been doing. One is economic domain. Through Belt Road Initiative and Asia Infrastructure Bank, they are trying to change the economic order of this part of uh, the world. And uh, in, uh, if you look at the behavior in South China Sea, East China Sea, Indian Ocean, you can see that that's also quite, uh, you can say, obvious. Now, uh, I, I, I'm not going to talk about all these things, and I will, I will, I will, I will skip to what, so one is basically rise of assertive China. The second one is basically what I say, U.S. policy to contest China's rise. Uh, though relative capacity of U.S. has become, you can say, weaker, but I think you can see, but still, uh, uh, Americans, they have been trying. Say, they earlier had something like hub and spoke, people used to say. Last 10, 12 years, they talked about pivot to Asia policy, but now they have been talking about Quad, Indo-Pacific strategy. And what is this Indo-Pacific strategy? It's basically, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, even though they don't pronounce it officially, but it has definitely to do with China and creating a network of four important players in this region of the world to create a kind of, uh, say, open and free Indo-Pacific. Uh, so this is basically the second narrative which is happening in this part of the world. Now the third important variable is uh, Japan quest for becoming a normal, I think uh, Titli uh, mentioned about details how uh, Japan had been uh, changing and how they have been. So my, my, my basic uh, addition could be that, look, uh, in case of J Japan, I think in last uh, uh, two, three years during Trump's period, I can see that uh, Japan had been successfully able to reinvent itself. And rather than only talking about bilateral uh, security alliance with United States, they have been also able to adopt this Indo-Pacific strategy. Much. Actually, they propose, in a way, uh, when 2007 he proposed about Indo-Pacific, I think uh, we know about that. So these are the things, actually, and I feel that this, this uh, Japan rise, definitely, and it has very important implication for Korean Peninsula. So 
these are the external changes happening around Korean Peninsula, but inside also there have been lots of significant uh, development like North Korean nuclear missile capacity, you must have known about that. Uh, South Korea, at present, they are, uh, at present South Korean government, they are for the engagement policy which have in North Korea. And uh, South Korean alliance with US is also slightly strained. Uh, it's, it's because actually US is demanding too much, you can say, cost sharing. Actually, recent uh, uh, news items talking about maybe five billion uh, every year. That's too much uh, from South Korean perspective. And uh, I think uh, South Korea has also lots of important uh, disagreements and disputes with Japan. You can see historically. In case uh, that's required, we will discuss it further. So inside Korean Peninsula, also lots of developments happening. So how do regional these important regional players they look at Korea? I think. For most of them, divided Korea is useful. Because that is basically quite, throughout the Cold War, they adjusted their foreign policy, and they are quite happy and, uh, can say, OK with this uh, divided Korea. Uh, China and US, they contest for their influence and connection with North Korea and South Korea, respectively. In 2014, 15, 16, at least three years, China tried to reach out South Korea in security domain. and. They had annual summit meeting, Xi Jinping and Park Geun-hye. They had annual summit meeting for long period, like say one week. And there was a time when actually China was appearing to be drifting away from North Korea. But again, it has come back to North Korea. We can discuss it further in question answer in case required. In case of US actually, US-South Korea alliance, I think US-South Korean alliance is still problematic. US basically, they are. Uh, much more concerned about nuclear issue and less concerned about their alliance with South Korea. So even though their priorities may be same, but uh, they, 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 their security concern may be same, but their priorities are different. So we'll talk about that in case required. And Japan also is happy with, because as, uh, if Shinzo Abe wants to move from Yoshida, Yoshida doctrine to uh, Abe doctrine, that's going to be useful. So. Uh, I think uh, North Korea and South Korea, how do they look? North Korea is happier because they have more strategic space. They have regained China. And I think uh, South Korea slightly in a difficult position because uh, it's still not able to have uh, enough uh, progress in with, with North Korea. China is also, I think, uh, they have not been able to still have because of THAAD and other system. Uh, in, 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 uh, in case of US also, you can see that how uh, they are demanding too much and this. So uh, I think uh, overall I will conclude uh, by saying that there are two, three big trends. One is basically, two, three actually, a rise of a certain China looking from Korea, and two is US-led Indo-Pacific strategy. Japan is, I, I consider that's part of Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, uh, so, uh, and, and, and Another problem is North Korean nuclear missiles. So two big trend, two big important uh, narratives, and one, what, 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 and it's difficult for South Koreans to choose. It's a, it's a situation of dilemma and confusion. If you go to South Korea, you can see almost every Saturday, Sunday, lakhs of people, they come on the street, sometimes supporting president, sometimes opposing president, sometimes supporting United States, sometimes opposing North Korea. So sometimes opposing Japan, so it's a very difficult period, uh, a period of confusion in South Korean politics. So I, I conclude by saying that maybe it appears to me that it could be the beginning of third big change in East Asia, or say we are in third change of East Asia, and it's, it's going to be a difficult time for Korea. Especially if I look, up, look at it from South Korean perspective, I will say that in earlier two occasions, they had very limited capacity. Relatively now, they have much more economic and cultural outreach. So I think, I hope that they'll be able to have better, you can say, uh, able, able to better deal with the situation. But at least from Korea, East Asia looked quite pessimistic. And uh, I think Koreans are in confusion, in, in, in I think, uh, dilemma, in, you can say, indecisiveness, what to do, whether they should choose China, whether they should choose United States, what to do with North Korea and North Korean nuclear issue. So this is a very uh, problematic part, uh, period for Korea. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Santip. I, I think it was quite a exhaustive coverage, and uh, you brought in so many factors. The three big changes, as you identified them, 
the uh, World War II impact on uh, Korea, the impact of the rise of China and Korea, the <clears throat> security considerations of Quad, how the Koreans view it, and uh, the rise of, um, you know, whether Japan can uh, ever be a normal country and uh, how that is going to impact uh, uh, the Korean Peninsula. The nuclear missiles issue of North Korea, how that uh, impacts um, the South Korea. The current strains in the U.S. alliance uh, with South Korea, etc. And you rightly pointed out how a divided South Korea, many of the stakeholders in the region find this quite useful to them, you know, despite uh, uh, what would be their public posturings. So the <coughs> I think you threw up quite a number of things to consider when you ended on the note that uh, South Korea is confused about the uh, future trajectory, what kind of course to take. I think that gives us a lot of food for thought and uh, questions to raise. Um, thank you. Uh, we move on to the next uh, scholar, Ambassador Skantayal, uh, <coughs> who, who was a former ambassador to South Korea. Uh, he would be talking on the India strategic engagement with Middle East middle powers in East Asia. Uh, Ambassador Tayal, as uh, most of you must be familiar with, is a leading scholar on South Korea. And uh, we had the pleasure of uh, having him as a, one of our faculty members some time back. And uh, I can put it on record that the department is much richer because of our association with him. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Bala. I'll, uh, share my thoughts on India's engagement with uh, middle bar in East Asia. Titli uh, and Sandeep have already given the context how East Asia is changing, but still I'll underline one or two points. One, of course, the US-led world order is under pressure, and it is under a dynamic change. <coughs> Not only in East Asia, globally, President Macron yesterday said that NATO need is in some kind of a <coughs> paralysis, etc. The Trumpian uh, foreign policy is transactional, but what is to consider for scholars is whether it is a temporary phase or a more permanent phase in American foreign policy. That sense of withdrawal, again isolation, because this, this kind of phase comes again and again in, uh, in uh, US foreign policy. And that will have consequences for um, East Asia, particularly for um, extended nuclear deterrence, whether uh, it is valid uh, at all uh, for Japan and uh, South Korea. And the democratic uh, regimes in uh, the middle past, I'll say middle past, what I'll look at really is Korea, Indonesia, Australia, and Vietnam. Vietnam is not really democratic, but uh, that the democratic powers are under some kind of a disadvantage because there are so many populist pressures and very short-term policies they have to make. And um, uh, in that scenario, it becomes difficult for middle powers, democratic middle powers, to have a long-term strategy and work for it and take hard decisions. Second shift of economic part in the Pacific or <clears throat> Asia has been taking place. It will go on. Uh, but it is up to a point. Europe still remains a very strong um, uh, economic power and will continue to be so. And of course, America is still uh, dominant and will perhaps continue to be so at least a couple of decades. But looking at it from India's point of view, where is India now that we are unable to sign RCEP? SEPA with Japan and Korea is not working very well to our advantage. That gives us a very unique kind of a position <coughs> in, uh, in East Asia. We are getting a little detached economically from East Asia. And also, of course, there is lack of trust and confidence among the major players in, uh, in East Asia. West Europe had a very fresh start because of uh, some kind of a uh, understanding between Germany and France. But because of China-India differences, China-Japan differences, East Asia is in a different category. Rise of China has already been dealt with, so I'll not uh, go deep into it, except to say that uh, most East Asian countries will 
choose from between two extremities, as the Koreans call it, bandwagoning and containment of China. Either you join the bandwagon of uh, China or try to contain China. These will be the, between these two limits, um, the middle powers of East Asia will try to fashion their foreign policy. Again, the middle powers are okay, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Australia. They certainly have more strategic autonomy now. Alliances are there, but Republic of Korea is not blindly following uh, uh, United States. They have their own independent policy, particularly with North Korea, even otherwise trying to <coughs> have be a balancer between China and, uh, and uh, United States. And they desire more space for themselves while dealing with China or and United States. And as was said, economic dependence on China is growing and there is also attraction of massive investments. <coughs> a few years back, a concept had been flown, a coalition of middle powers, there were a lot of articles on that, but uh, I think that has lost traction. And uh, uh, because countries have divergent interests, and it is very difficult for them to come together on a broad spectrum uh, basis. When India engages with uh, countries of East Asia, and we have a very deep engagement, how do we present our uh, concerns and how we need to um, further our own national interests while interacting with them? So the first uh, <coughs> caveat would be that one should not try to um, look at our relations with other countries of East Asia, particularly middle powers, with the prism of or through the prism of China, because that will become very difficult uh, to talk to them uh, on that basis. So the the approach is to look for convergences, convergences of perceptions, convergences of strategic. Uh, 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 objectives for the region. <coughs> now that, uh, so the first perhaps now for our foreign policy is to have a shared vision for Indo-Pacific and East Asia. And what could be that shared vision? One point which we need to emphasize again and again and again is the need to have a multipolar East Asia. And uh, uh, I'll not dwell on these points because this is a very knowledgeable uh, uh, audience. Second point, I think the four middle powers perhaps are at convergence on, on this. With us, robust presence of US in Indo-Pacific is essential for peace and stability in East Asia. Second point we can all uh, uh, agree is that peaceful, open and secure East Asia. And in that Prime Minister Modi's statement at Shangri-La, I think, is the benchmark and it really gives the parameters what is our vision of uh, inclusive, etc., cetera, uh, Indo-Pacific. And the corollary of that would be in which again all the powers uh, will agree, all the middle powers of East Asia, freedom of navigation, that particularly there should not be any regression, no new requirement of reporting, for instance, in South China Sea or elsewhere, <coughs> no new geographical limits that this area around this island is out of uh, bounds. How to maintain status quo in South China Sea, China Sea. Suppose at some point China has some air defense identification zone in South China Sea. How will the countries of the region react? Another new area which is coming very, very, uh, and has become very important is cyber security where again India has a lot of room to work with other middle powers <laughs> of, uh, of East Asia. Can India and other East Asian countries have a regional approach? Why should we always follow the West and America for particularly, say, protection of communication satellites? So there can be some, some broad understanding in East Asia where, where we can work with uh, our East Asian middle powers to uh, bring other countries also together to make our region more secure. <coughs> the other area where we need a constant dialogue with other uh, regional powers is the regional security architecture. Of course, all of us are uh, uh, wedded to ASEAN-centric uh, 
model, but is it viable? Is it effective? Right? There are lots of question marks. Then the East Asia summit process, how to make it more effective? Will there be, should be more participation in decision making, in agenda making, in preparation of uh, uh, papers, etc., by other members of EAS? Then, of course, <clears throat> what we need to explain to all our friends in East Asia and elsewhere is what is this creature quad? Now, Pompeo, Secretary of State Pompeo says it's like an Asian NATO, and we'll be very uncomfortable, I think, with that kind of a uh, uh, perception. But uh, there is a certain anti China <coughs> nuance to it. So, this will be a concept which we and our diplomats and our academics need to explain again and again to our interlocutors. Another point of concern where we need the support, strategic support of our uh, uh, Asian East Asian partners is to strengthen the UN system. UNCLOS, all of us uh, are wedded to it, but uh, that has been defied. World Trade Organization, what happens to WTO, dispute settlement mechanism is now going for a six because there will be no, um, there, there are no arbitrators there. And of course, in that context, we talk about UN Security Council and uh, uh, its expansion and our permanent membership. But the issue is the rule-based global order and how we push it in in um, in cooperation with our uh, with other middle powers. Then, a, then a, always a subject remains of concerted action against terrorism. What happened in Sri Lanka means or implies that no country of East Asia is really immune. And even may, there may not be a very visible jihadist kind of a trend, but any country can be a victim of terrorism and very grievous kind of terrorism. So the support in FATF, we require support of uh, our friends in uh, Financial ac uh, Action Task Force, and of course denial of sanctuaries, etc. And uh, a new topic for uh, our diplomats to explain to our friends would be on RCEP, that what is our concern, why we are uh, hesitant, and uh, when will we join, and on what terms. In uh, conclusion, I'll say that uh, India has been take, making strong efforts to deepen strategic partnership with middle Pass in East Asia and outside uh, Asian region also. And it is a, it, it is a, uh, it's a part of the foreign policy which is, which is continuous, whether it was the previous uh, uh, regime or the present regime. And again, the attempt should be to bring more and more convergence on our uh, uh, strategic perceptions, because that will be the foundation on which they <coughs> go forward. And on specific issues, one could, of course, go for bilateral, trilateral, and minilateral uh, uh, partnerships. Thank you very much. I think he gave focus, he ultimately he pointed out what this means for India and what are the things that, what are the implications for India, which I think is a very uh, important uh, contribution. So if the U.S. order in uh, Asia is under pressure and, uh, uh, you know, one is looking at the, um, one also finds that the democratic paths in a number of countries in this region um, is not... Uh, exactly uh, happy ones and uh, it is under strain and uh, <clears throat> what are the other factors uh, what is what he calls is the middle path um, these countries are not uh, neither want to be uh, seen to be attached too much in the bandwagon of china and uh, they don't want to be um, seen to be containing china either and um, how they try to ensure some kind of uh, strategic autonomy or some space to maneuver while they take care of their uh, uh, interests. And uh, how does, what does uh, all this mean for India uh, or some of the pertinent issues that he raised? He went to details of some of the issues that um, um, really concern us. And uh, RCEP probably is one of the uh, most important ones with that uh, concerns us now, apart from terrorism. How do we handle uh, issues in the various UN organizations? What is the value of uh, WTO now? Because it's getting more and more abused. And how do we, how do we sell the idea of uh, Quad uh, 
to others how do, how do we make uh, make it more acceptable and plus he raised a whole range of issues i'm sure there will be a number of questions uh, i thank the ambassador and uh, now we'll move on to the uh, last uh, speaker professor uh, <coughs> Jabin Jacob, who was uh, formerly with the ICS, who is currently associate professor at uh, Shivnadar University. Um, he would be talking on Taiwan, China, and the world, diplomatic clout versus democratic identity. And uh, since we are mostly familiar with uh, Jabin, who has been, uh, I think, quite prolific in his uh, academic writings, um, I'll call upon uh, the floor is yours, Jimmy. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> so yeah, it's good to be back at another <laughs> All India Conference of China Studies. And um, you know, I was also quite happy that I had the opportunity to get my students uh, yesterday to this conference. I mean, it, since this is a traveling carnival circus conference, uh, and it doesn't happen to be an NCR, uh, that was why the students were able to come. So uh, I'm particularly thankful for that opportunity. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> frankly, I threw out my original presentation after the trip back with my students yesterday night. We had a pretty long conversation. And I thought, uh, well, let's try and look at this uh, slightly differently. Frankly, that the title of the presentation came before I had anything written down. And that's the way pressure works from Professor Chakraborty or from Anand uh, that uh, give us a title, give us a title. So um, what I'm going to do is actually a mix of what's going on in the um, in Taiwan and you know in Taiwan's uh, international space and look at some larger trends and possibilities. And I also have to thank my uh, colleague uh, Mr. Shu Mingda who has just joined SNU as a Chinese language teacher from Taiwan. And we've had three days of conversations uh, in the cab here on Taiwan. So um, I, I have him also to thank for quite a bit of the insights. So um, I look at first what is going on. And in Taiwan itself, it's a very important uh, uh, trend of growing Chinese interference in Taiwanese domestic politics. And of course, this has implications for uh, the regional uh, politics and security issues as well. So in terms of information, uh, uh, interference, this extensive Chinese disinformation campaign, the Chinese uh, Communist Party through its United Front bodies, through the Association of Businessmen uh, uh, on Taiwan, uh, from Taiwan in China, are conducting uh, extensive campaigns through the media, through social media, through both traditional and social media, to sort of influence uh, events, influence policies, uh, thinking on China, on Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is going to have its uh, presidential elections next, uh, the coming January. So there's this. That's why it explains part of the uh, reason for this uh, high decibel campaign. In fact. Uh, of course, Taiwan also has certain conditions that uh, lay itself open to this such interference. Um, as I just said, Taiwan has a not insignificant number of businessmen with very close ties to the mainland, businessmen who are invested in, in China. And so they are susceptible to this sort of business uh, pressure from the Chinese Communist Party. The Taiwanese military leadership at the very top is rather conservative. I mean, there are still remnants of the old school KMT indoctrination. Uh, I mean, in a sense, uh, the Taiwanese military in the past was a, as much a military of the KMT as the PLA today is a military of the, uh, CM, uh, of the, of the Communist Party of China. Uh, the KMT leadership's one China policy still gives offers opportunities for uh, the mainland to make a to make its presence felt. But of course, since the arrival of the Democratic Progressive Party, a pro-independence uh, political party on the Taiwanese political scene, the Chinese communists have had to uh, try different methods. And blandishments uh, of various kinds have been offered. You know, the Chinese use tourism as a political tool. The Chinese can turn on or turn off the tap of tourists to any country as a way of putting economic pressure on that country. So, in fact, uh, ever since Tsai Ing-wen took over, 
uh, you know, the Chinese have basically turned off that tourism ta uh, tap from the mainland, affecting the Taiwanese local economy. Uh, of course, many Taiwanese friends are also quite glad, saying that we are glad, we are quite happy to not have so many mainlanders here because now we can go and revisit some of our own tourist spots. Uh, plus, <laughs> Japanese are returning, South Koreans are returning in larger numbers to Taiwan. And like Indian tourists uh, within India, you know, most uh, tourist spots in India prefer <coughs> foreign tourists because Indian tourists come in large numbers and spend very little money. Taiwanese have the same problem with mainland Chinese tourists coming to Taiwan. Come in large numbers but spend very little money. So uh, they prefer Japanese or Western tourists that way. But off late, I mean very recently the Chinese uh, put out what they call 26 measures, uh, early this month in fact, which followed on the 31 measures from February I think last year. These are different ways in which several incentives are given to the so-called Taiwan compatriots on the mainland for Taiwanese who want to work and study uh, or conduct business in Taiwan. Um, so the, I in China, sorry, and uh, the Chinese are saying, well, the Taiwanese can invest in our infrastructure, in 5G, in aviation, also all manner of uh, industry, uh, manufacturing and services uh, sector in China. The Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's uh, Mainland Affairs Council, for example, has actually come out saying, well, these are just uh, ways of trying to bribe the Taiwanese people before the elections uh, in, in January. Um, but, you know, this, uh, so it's a, it's a mix, it's a very sophisticated mix of overt uh, coercion as well as subtle uh, messaging to the Taiwanese that the Chinese Communist Party engages in. I mean, the Communist Party wouldn't be the Communist Party if we didn't combine the blunt with the very subtle. Um, now, in terms of impact, uh, e economic impact, I already mentioned the, uh, the economic uh, consequences of uh, the Chinese mainland, the Communist Party, putting pressure on Taiwan. But from a security point of view, the Chinese have increased their uh, PLA Air Force and PLA Navy activity in and around, uh, around, around uh, Taiwan. Uh, politically, of course, the Hong Kong protests are considered to have made a major impact on uh, Taiwanese domestic politics. There are two ways of, uh, I mean, two um, lines of thinking on this. One is, of course, Tsai Ing-wen's ratings were very poor. Uh, I mean, she practically didn't make the nomination of her own party. Uh, it was just by the skin of her teeth that she made the nomination of her own party uh, in the primaries of the DPP. But the uh, Hong Kong protest movement also sort of seem to have given a flip to her chances vis-a-vis -vis, uh, mm -hmm. the KMT. And the KMT has sort of shot itself in the foot by choosing a candidate who's not the most, uh, or let's just say he's, he's got a tendency to put his foot in at the most uh, awkward, you know, inappropriate moments. And uh, probably not the best candidate the KMT has chosen, uh, Hang Go Yu. Uh, mayor of Kaohsiung. Um, but the other line is that this did not, the Hong Kong movement doesn't have such an impact on, uh, on Taiwanese politics because of the nature of Taiwanese politics itself. Taiwanese are no longer only uh, paying attention to what the Chinese are doing or Chinese are thinking about, but they have very, very real concerns at home. The Taiwanese economy has not been doing too great. And there is actually a sort of a, a gap in policy uh, approaches opening up between the political parties in Taiwan. And I think uh, that's interesting because that speaks to a certain maturity of the Taiwanese political space, quite independent of whatever else the world might be thinking, what the world might be doing. Now in terms of, uh, you know, the diplomatic clout part of my presentation, uh, the, the, when you come to the external uh, security issues or se external aspect, um, it's clear that Taiwan's diplomatic space is shrinking. The Chinese under Xi Jinping have, especially since Tsai Ing-wen has come to power, has targeted, is engaged in a long-term strategy of weaning away Taiwan's, uh, the number of the states that recognize Taiwan diplomatically. And this isn't going to stop. The Taiwanese are aware, aware of it. And, uh, uh, you know, the DPP government is also uh, sort of taking measures uh, to respond to this in kind. In a, in a sense, the new southbound policy of the DPP government 
is partly a response to this international increased international pressure that the, uh, the Chinese are putting on Taiwan or Taiwan's allies. Um, Xi Jinping also seems to signal uh, growing impatience with respect to the idea of reunification. I mean, the Chinese seem to indicate that they are not willing to wait too long for reunification. I think that's just a, a feint. Uh, it, you know, I, I don't think the Chinese would dare use uh, coercive military measures to take over Taiwan. But it's very useful in trying to portray this sort of a, uh, image to countries around the region because they tend to think then, well, we need to do something about it. Uh, or the Taiwanese need to ensure uh, that they do not seek independence and so on. So at the, at the moment, Taiwan has 16 diplomatic allies. Whether the count hits zero or not is a matter of how the Chinese uh, leadership decides what the international situation is like, what the regional situation is like, and what they perceive Taiwan's domestic politics, uh, what the shape <laughs> that the Taiwan's domestic <laughs> politics is going to take. Uh, but, and you know, in addition to this, there's all this, also the shrinking cultural space that the Taiwanese are suffering from, or well, or the, Thai, or the Chinese are going to, are, are, are uh, creating uh, in the sense that, uh, for example, the movie Top Gun, that the latest version of Top Gun that was released, you saw that Tom Cruise's jacket suddenly was missing the flags of Japan and Taiwan, which was there in the original uh, Top Gun movie. And that's because uh, it's a Chinese company. I think it's Tencent or Alibaba, one of them, who's actually now a sponsor of these uh, Chinese. I think we had this conversation yesterday. So. Uh, that kind of effort to shrink not just Taiwan's diplomatic space, but also Taiwan's cultural space around the world is also ongoing. But all of this also then creates other possibilities for Taiwan. And one very important fact that people tend to forget is the importance of the Taiwan Relations Act that the US Congress passed as soon as the United States switched diplomatic recognition from the ROC to the PRC. The Taiwan Relations Act is just celebrated 40 years. And you know, it's, it, the international situation when the TRA came into existence has changed. Taiwan's own, own politics has changed. Uh, but despite the fact that nobody seems to be happy, with, whether in the United <laughs> States or in Taiwan with the Taiwan <laughs> Relations Act, the fact is that this act has actually been quite useful. It has a certain amount of flexibility. It's, it, the language is very broad. It has a certain amount of flexibility that allows it to function to be resilient, and for the Americans to take various steps to respond to uh, Chinese pressure on Taiwan. So I think, uh, in a sense, you could shift the narrative, and since this session is, has the word narrative in it, you could say that Taiwan's diplomatic space is shrinking. But at the very same time, uh, the fact that Solomon Islands, which was the last country to shift uh, diplomatic recognition from PRC, uh, ROC to PRC, you saw that in Solomon Islands, this debate actually took place in the open. There were weeks of debate before they decided to make the shift. And that was not the case before. Before, it just took place surreptitiously. I mean, when I was in Taiwan, suddenly my African friends or Pacific Island friends would disappear overnight. And you would hear that because their country has switched recognition to PRC, they are now on scholarship, not in Taiwan, but in, in Beijing. This doesn't happen. I mean, this can still happen. But it also means that um, while Taiwan's diplomatic space is shrinking, the identity of Taiwan as a democratic country, that uh, space is also increasing. There are still friends of Taiwan in all of these countries that have shifted recognition to China. So in a sense, it's, uh, you could argue that principles of democracy are, um, uh, are contending with dollar diplomacy or RMB diplomacy. Now, in terms of uh, a conclusion, I would say that uh, so far the world has only considered the fact that Taiwan is constantly losing diplomatic allies. But I would say that Taiwan can lose all the diplomatic allies it, there are, but in many ways it is, as Ambassador Skantayal talked about, a middle power by many uh, definitions. So it remains a strong economic entity. It has an independent existence at the WTO. It has a fairly strong military. Uh, the Chinese PLA is not going to be taking over it very soon. And together with the TRA and the new southbound policy, <laughs> Taiwan is carving out a new kind of diplomatic space. So Taiwan's domestic 
political identity is not just responding uh, to its domestic concerns or the uh, you know Taiwan China equation, but is also responding to international challenges. And uh, in that sense, I think it's interesting to see how the Taiwanese are changing their history textbooks. Is, some, is an idea that uh, Xu Ming gave me in the morning also that the emphasis on Chinese history in Taiwanese history textbooks is reducing. And I think to conclude with a sort of a lesson for India, and I've said this before, this emphasis on civilizational ties and historical ties between India and China, you know, I'm frankly getting quite tired of it. Uh, I, I have very little patience for either Professor Than Chung or sometimes with Professor Monty or with the MEA when they sort of highlight this business of historical ties and civilizational connect between India and China. Mm -hmm. Because really this is not based on current reality. <coughs> and it only plays into what the Chinese like to say. Because history, reference to history and culture sort of uh, reduces this impression of Taiwan, uh, China as an authoritarian state of somehow uh, being a, a negative actor in current international relations. Because everybody refers to this great history and civilization. Uh, but that's not really very helpful for countries with democratic space or democratic identities which are supposed to rely on constitutional values. So I, I would say uh, maybe the Taiwanese example is something that uh, we could also pay attention to and sort of follow. Um, and that this offers fresh <laughs> possibilities of looking at the East Asian, East Asian political space as a whole. So to conclude with what, uh, sorry, that's the third conclusion. With what uh, Sandeep said, you know, he, he talked about Korea as the wrong country in the wrong space. Uh, I would say Taiwan is probably turning into the right country in the right space in the right century. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Jobin. Uh, I think quite uh, a fresh way of looking at things, though if a uh, little provocative. Uh, I talked about the <clears throat> the way the diplomatic space of Taiwan uh, is keep getting reduced and how it can uh, take on using it the um, democracy uh, element, um, highlighting the democracy element and the tussle between these two. Um, <clears throat> now uh, the floor is open for questions and uh, uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes. And um, as is the custom here, uh, I think we start with 20 minutes. Yeah, we can we start with the younger scholars? We give them a chance. Is it fine, sir? So uh, maybe the under 35 rule? Yeah. Yeah. Um, please uh, mention your name, affiliation, and uh, please be pointed. Uh, you know, the question should be brief and. Uh, uh, so I'm Ritika. Um, I'm a uh, MPhil student from JNU. Uh, my question is to Ambassador Skantayal. Uh, so you, in your presentation, mentioned about uh, uh, the court and uh, the convergence we are uh, looking for. Uh, you also mentioned about the statement by Pompeo and how it's a bit problematic for us. Um, I, I mean, I would just want to gain some understanding that would you agree that right now the members of court have divergent definitions for court? And how are we supposed to look for convergence when, when <coughs> our approaches towards board are very divergent? Yeah, I think we collect questions and then uh, anybody else? Uh, sir, can we finish the younger ones first? Under 35? Is that all? Yeah. I have another question on quads. Uh, uh, what is your opinion if Quad has to start as an infrastructure alliance and graduate it to a security alliance? Anybody else? Yeah, I think uh, now we wave it off uh, under 100. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody under 100? Welcome. Yeah. Uh, Ravi, please. <laughs> uh, two questions. One to Jabin. Uh, towards the end, you mentioned, Jabin, that uh, Taiwan is, uh, is, how shall I put it, minimizing its reliance on Chinese history. China, and uh, so it surprised me for a 
democratic country like Taiwan to take that approach. One has heard of history being rewritten in, 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 in many nations but with different uh, uh, governmental types. But I mean, is that really productive? Can, can Iran, for example, erase or uh, extinguish the Persian Empire or Egypt, uh, de pharaonic herself? Um, how does it really work and is it going to be helpful to Taiwan to do that? That's my, my question to you. And to Sandeep, the question is that this uh, confusion and ambiguity that you mentioned uh, that South Korea finds itself uh, has, of course, created a lot of uncertainties and so on. But in a way, might it have really added to the extraordinary achievements that it has undergone, it has achieved um, in economic terms, in per capita income, uh, it's leading in scientific creativity and innovation, uh, stem cell research, many other areas. <coughs> Culturally, for a small country, it's huge impact in in films and TV and most of all uh, K-pop, including our own uh, Northeast. Uh, so in many ways, one might say they are in a very enviable position in, uh, in the world in terms of all these achievements. So maybe there is something to be said for living in uncertainty and confusion. Thank you. Ambassador, you had a question. Uh, I have a question each for Dr. Basu and uh, Sandeep and a comment for uh, Jabin. So let me start with a comment. Uh, this new southbound policy uh, reappears every time the DPP comes to power. So I think, you know, we need to look at it a little differently because it's not new. It started earlier also. So every time they have a problem in China, they start looking at new southbound policy. And it doesn't really work beyond a point. It limits itself to ASEAN. It's, at least that's been my my experience. Uh, uh, question for Dr. Basu. You know, Mr. Abe technically <coughs> is in his last term. Of course, they'll change the party constitution and he'll probably stay on as prime minister as long as he keeps winning elections. Uh, but how mainstream is his view on China's, on Japan's militarization or Japan becoming a normal country? Because at least the public opinion polls seem to suggest that there is very strong opposition to what he wants to do. I mean, there is not a majority view on what he wants to do. Uh, so how do, you, how do you look at that? And you know, particularly in the context of uh, the changing situation in East Asia, yet the public opinion seems to say that Japan should not go down the military route. Um, question for uh, Sandeep. Sandeep, you know, you of course said that Korea seems to be confused, whatever, in a dilemma, etc. How do you explain President Moon's policies? There's been inconsistency in his approach to many issues now. Why has he suddenly raised the comfort issue to such heights that, you know, he wants to take on everybody together? I mean, there's no, there's no sanctity with the relationship with the U.S. anymore. The DPRK thing is not going well. He's taken on Japan in a big way, not just on the comfort woman issue. What is he trying to achieve? It's a one-term president in Korea. So wait, which way is Korea headed under Mr. Moon? Please be brief. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question also is related to Quad. But before I ask the question, I have an observation on the panel, which is uh, secur security and geopolitical narratives in East Asia. It's very interesting. Th just a matter of observation that the speakers, uh, first and uh, third speaker, first and the fourth speaker did not mention Quad at all and the second and third speakers did talk about Quad. And also the two speakers together sitting on the left did not speak about Quad, and the two speakers sitting on the right uh, <laughs> did talk about Quad. Hemant, what's your comment? Or My question? question is that uh, China's reaction to the second uh, innings of Quad was, uh, I mean, some say, very arrogant and uh, arrogant dismissal of the second coming of Quad, and some say very irritate, irritated uh, reaction and one of the uh, articles I saw in 2017 after the second coming of court was that it is a beggar's club that was one of the Chinese reactions to the coming of court that it's a beggar's club so they just dismissed it like that so what is your comment on that Chinese dismissal okay. of 
quote. Thank, thank you, thank you. For uh, Ambassador, you had something? No, one very you know, brief comment on uh, what uh, the point Jabin raised about uh, civilizational connect and to what extent it's divorced from current reality. I think it's a very important point we need to bear in mind. Civilizational connect can be very useful if you want to promote tourism, you know, use it as a practical instrument, but as a basis or foundation for seeking a uh, uh, different kind of engagement with China, to what extent it's useful, I think, uh, point Jabin has raised uh, is worth pondering over, though it's not quite you no know, subject of this session's uh, discussion. Now, I have, in fact, a question for Jabin. Uh, uh, you talked about uh, growing impatience of Xi Jinping on the issue of reunification and how you know, re reunification has been positioned as a very important uh, objective, including in context of you know, centennial goals of uh, CPC. Uh, at the same time, you know, you seem to suggest that uh, uh, the likelihood of taking resort to use of force uh, is not so much. You know. Then what's the alternative? Because if you look at facts on the ground, uh, earlier expectations in CPC that with growing economic interdependence between PRC and Taiwan, uh, Taiwan will move closer to China, that hasn't quite been borne out. In fact, the sense of Taiwanese identity <laughs> has become stronger. Uh, Taiwan, as you rightly pointed out, uh, its democratic identity is getting stronger. Even though, in traditional terms, Taiwan is losing democratic space, <coughs> counting in a number of uh, countries is recognized ROC, uh, it has opened up other avenues. So its international personality actually is not getting eroded. Uh, uh, so you have this yeah. dilemma. Can we? How do you see it? panning out, would like to speculate on timeline for reunification and can we run into a really sticky situation because a lot of people in Taiwan, if you talk to them, they are really concerned about, uh, uh, you know, a military solution not being put off the table. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we need to give time to the uh, presenters to respond, but uh, briefly, you had some questions. Very brief question. Uh, please. I'm very surprised to Javen's comment about the dismissal of the history and historical ties in the uh, two countries, because or any country, for example. Briefly, ma'am. Yes, they've they are played out in terms of the importance and use is made or sometimes not used, but you can't dismiss it. That was a, how okay. do, can you dismiss that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very brief. Yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, yeah. I've done my master's Quickly. from JNU. Uh, my question is to Jebin, sir. The question is regarding uh, the uh, power projection that China is doing. Uh, do you see it as a soft power projection now since you have considered uh, cultural and technological tools as just a means that China use in its own leverage? Do you also then put these two uh, you know, tools in the hard power section? like many uh, scholars like Joseph Nash? Yeah, I think you asked a question. Thank you. Um, we give uh, about uh, two to three minutes. We start with uh, Dr. Titli Basu. Brief responses. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for the question. Um, I agree with you in terms of if you, when you look at uh, the public perception and the mobilization, both in terms of the protests that we have seen consistently since 2013 when the policy changes started unfolding and also the public opinion polls and the uh, i think the ca cabinet ratings and so on in terms of this particular issue uh, there has not been much uh, in terms of uh, gaining public support one of the fundamental reasons why even when uh, Abe had two-third majority in both the houses of the parliament, he could not go for the national referendum. So having said that, um, it is also uh, uh, the other part of the story is the policy changes that are, that are happening is quite permanent. Uh, the reinterpret because one of the reasons why he also could not go for an amendment process um, under Article 96 and bypassed it, you know, through a cabinet decision was because uh, there was no support. But uh, 
once he interpreted uh, the scope of Article 9, he uh, actually translated into uh, various laws, a set of laws uh, the following year, and subsequently based on, uh, founded on those uh, legal framework, he has <coughs> unfolded a lot of uh, changes, um, not just the uh, collective self-defense, um, exercise of right of collective self-defense. So uh, the, the normalization is unfolding in terms of permanent uh, policy changes, and how far it will uh, continue after uh, Abe, you are right that he is already into the third term and uh, unlikely uh, to go ahead after 2021. But um, there is also certain conversation happening within LDP that they probably don't mind to give him a fourth term. Uh, the Suga has already uh, uh, indicated towards it. But even if that doesn't happen, the next uh, range of leadership uh, that they are, get, they are, they are cultivating for uh, as a replacement of Abe when he leaves uh, are uh, also are also if you look at uh, uh, Motegi or Tarova, so all the front runners are actually, you know, are all normalists who uh, actively participated in um, translating uh, these uh, into laws and also executing uh, it in, from their own cabinet positions. So their uh, their um, uh, if 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 the current set of names that are circulating if they come. Uh, I think it will be a continuous process. Okay, thank you, Tritli. Anything more? Any other response? Okay. Uh, it's Sandeep's turn. Yeah, I think two questions to me. One uh, by Ravi, sir. Uh, my uh, answer would be that, yes, I agree that even though Korean, South Koreans are confused, indecisive, but at the same time, they have lots of, you can say, scientific, economic, and cultural, you can say, capacities, which have been proven actually very important. And that's why if you look at South Korean foreign policy making, for last almost eight, ten years, there's an element of some kind of, say, trying to find out uh, new agenda items. Like, say, if we talk about power and power politics, balance of power, then I think South Korea is not going to be a very important player. But if we talk about, say, environment, disaster relief, so many other things, uh, Korea could be a very important player. And that's why they have been trying, through different multilateral uh, bodies, including ASEAN, they have been trying to bring in these new agenda items so that they can compete and they can, they can basically lead because South Korea is probably one of the only countries, like one of the few, uh, I think, I don't know the second one, uh, who was earlier aid receiving country and now they are a donor country. So they are providing ODA to several countries. So yeah. they have been trying. Uh, about uh, your question, sir, uh, my, uh, my uh, thing is that I, I feel that Moon Jae-in, South Korean present president, he is quite consistent. The only problem which I see that he is a gentleman, progressive politician, who is caught, caught into very aggressive leaderships. If you look at uh, his policy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, engagement policy, this has been a consistent policy for almost two decades, his party and his own. That, yeah. Yeah. Secondly, with Japan also, the recent crisis is not because of actually uh, Moon Jae-in. What happened that South Korean <coughs> court last year, they decided that, you know, labor, like forced labor during colonial period, they should be repaid, like they should be compensated. So Moon Jae-in said that, look, uh, you can say, what can we do if the court orders something? So he informed Japanese that let's, let's try to have a joint fund. South Korea is also ready to contribute in, a, in that joint fund and we can we can compensate those forced labor. In US also, in case of US, uh, since Trump is actually uh, okay with his engagement policy, so with on North Korean issue they are almost on the same uh, table. But in case of alliance, how, because Trump has been looking for transactional, we say whatever uh, expenditure is there, 100% cost would be shared by South Koreans. Whereas for South Korean perspective, it doesn't look quite appropriate thing. So I will say that rather than being inconsistent, he appears to be a gentleman caught into, we can say, strong leadership and okay. Thank aggressive you, leadership. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Tayal. Thank you. Uh, questions to me were around Quad. Quad is certainly a manifestation of the hedging strategy which some countries are adopting. Now, including the four uh, against the rise of China in case it becomes more hostile and more assertive and more difficult. Divergent approaches, yes, certainly all the four countries have divergent approaches to Quad and their approach will change from month to month depending on their bilateral relations with China. 
and for australia we should always remember that uh, kevin rudd's period was a period when australia refused to sell uranium to india <laughs> and uh, such a period can come back so uh, every I, I i don't think quad comes with a joint statement because everybody issues its own <coughs> statement after the meetings so it's a very much a work in progress and uh, on infrastructure alliances uh, I don't think Quad is a forum to have really developed infrastructure. If infrastructure is to be developed, the really the the country which needs it among the four is India, and India can do it bilaterally, which we are doing with Japan. There is no need to go under the umbrella of Quad for infrastructure <coughs> development of uh, India. The other three countries don't really need other country support. and china's reaction um, uh, beggars club etc of course it is very understandable they they understand that the underlying uh, concern is an aggressive rise of china <clears throat> and this is a forum where the countries four countries important countries can come together to contain china in case the situation so arises thank you thank you uh, a brief uh, uh, before uh, uh, jabin uh, has his turn uh, sandeep has a small post yeah, of yeah small uh, you can say because there are many questions so one question uh, which i found actually there uh, when you are saying that democratic identity of taiwan matters and you are saying that uh, you can say civilizational connects they don't matter i think there's a mismatch because i have seen that several democracies they are democracy they have been cooperating with non democratic country because if you are talking about power politics then it's okay but if you are talking about ideas identities soft issues and they are important for to bilateral relations so i think if you are saying that democratic identity matters then you have to fine. also say that uh, you can say civilizational connects matter so your fine, response fine. your comment is made yeah. all right so <coughs> um i'll start with these last two questions by both sandeep and dr kelka firstly i'm not saying civilization ties do not matter i'm not saying history is not important but if we actually studied history and civilization honestly and sincerely then we would realize that engagement on these two sub these two prongs with the chinese is deeply problematic because there isn't that similar honesty or sincerity on the chinese side in the study of history or civilization because for them it's extremely instrumental i mean uh, again to to get to your point you know when the chinese started having a 5000 year history it's when chang zemin went to egypt and discovered that the egyptians were claiming 5000 years of history until then the chinese only had 3000 years of history so then he comes back to china and starts ordering his academics say we have to create 5000 years of history <laughs> all right and now in india also we see this competitive you know business of yeah my history is longer than yours or you know so I, it doesn't help i mean the examples it's instructive that the examples that you gave sir uh, are of iran and egypt both are extremely hegemonic i mean for them to claim this history is okay because they have this hegemonic notion of well our history extended so far and so far beyond but you see what are the uses they make of the history it isn't getting them anywhere and my problem essentially is that things like i mean there is himalaya sphere and there is himalaya sphere but frankly and with all due respect professor than chung's idea of himalaya sphere is in my view sheer fiction you can't work on the basis of imagined connections that didn't exist because if that is the case then you would actually really have to engage with uh, you know uh, much more detail than the chinese are willing to acknowledge so and you know in terms of uh, taiwan i would say the taiwanese seem to recognize that this sort of fiction cannot continue one of the big things in the change of taiwanese approaches to studying history is not that they are dismissing or delinking entirely from china uh, their their relationship with china but they are also giving greater space to their own local histories the history of the aborigines for example so i mean that even when i was a student in taiwan i saw that the attitude towards the aboriginal population in taiwan was changing massively <laughs> and the big difference between hong kong and taiwan i mean you say that hong kong's political movement has has an impact on taiwan but frankly i would say hong kong uh, the big difference is that hong kong racism hasn't declined you look at the way hong kongers treat their foreign laborers versus the way the taiwanese treat their foreign laborers under the dpp especially a lot of uh, progressive policies have been implemented in terms of how taiwanese treat their foreign workers and so on and that really has a lot to do with this 
this internalization or the maturity of democratic space and thinking inside Taiwan, that you also begin to treat outsiders as value, as valuable or as worthy of equal rights to your citizens. This sort of uh, parochial, I, me, myself approach to citizenship rights is no longer the case in Taiwan. I think that's very important. Uh, to Anjali's question about uh, power projection, look, China, China's soft power is actually hard power. I mean, I think that expression sharp power is very useful to sort of note in this case. Uh, Ambassador Suri is right. There is, I mean, the new southbound policy keeps coming back in different forms, but I think ever since it was properly articulated under Tsai Ing-wen, it is, and you, you are aware of it, there's greater muscle to it. There's, in fact, the very relationship with India and Taiwan has sort of transformed in many ways. It's not consistent. It's not yet on sustainable sure footing, but it is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, to Ambassador Kantor's question, I mean, I would say rhetoric apart, uh, there are no clear goals. I mean, the, the goal for reunification, the timeline keeps shifting. I mean, there are two centennials after all. It certainly is not 2021 that it's going to be reunification. I think 2049 and 2049 is, as you know, Keynes said, in the long run, we might all be dead. So that's it's a long run uh, goal. And uh, I think over Taiwanese concerns on this, I think they're also sort of playing it smart because unless they express concerns, how are the Chinese, Americans going to sell them the F-16s? How are they going to keep American Congress alert and sharp and on their toes vis-a-vis -vis China. And I think the Taiwanese have also used this moment of a recalibration of American policy towards East Asia, or towards China, to their advantage. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a skeptic whether the Chinese would be so foolish as to engage in a, a kinetic conflict. But there is great value in ensuring that the rhetoric is at high level and everybody remains concerned and is talking about mm -hmm. this issue. And that sort of plays to the advantage of the Chinese. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that was wonderful. Um, thank all the four uh, presenters. And uh, thank the, uh, Dr. Avinash and the organizers for this wonderful uh, conference. And finally, uh, I do thank the under 35s and under 100s. Thank you.